All right, here is the Torah portion for today. And what does that say? Tazria. And what does Tazria mean? She conceives. And we find in Leviticus 12, 1 through 3, how the Lord spoke to Moses saying, tell the children of Israel, if a woman conceives and she has a little boy, She's unclean for seven days, just as in the days of her monthly period, she'll be unclean. But the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin, that's when he's supposed to be circumcised. The circumcision is the cutting off of all flesh on the eighth day. Well, guess what? A day with the Lord is a thousand years. We're going to be here for 7,000 years. And then the eighth day is the cutting off of the world, the heavens, and you have a new heaven and a new earth. This is all seen in patterns. Now, in Leviticus 12, 6, it says, when the days of her purifying are fulfilled, if it's a little boy or a daughter, what is she supposed to bring at the end? A lamb of the first year, okay, for a burnt offering, and then a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to the priest. Now, let's jump to Luke chapter 2, 22. It says, according, this is for Miriam after Yeshua was born. It says, when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses. So her purification was based on Leviticus 12. They brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Okay, he's already been circumcised. This is after like 30 days. And look at what it says in Leviticus 12.8. If she's not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, one for the burnt offering, the other for a sin offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for her and she shall be clean. When you read the book of Luke, she brings two turtle doves. What does that tell you? Because they brought only two turtle doves a month after he was born. They, well, the reason they only brought two turtle doves, they were required to bring a lamb. But they couldn't afford it. They didn't have any money. She couldn't afford a lamb. That's why she brought the two turtle doves. When you read Leviticus, it goes on to say, like, if they're too poor, then they can bring the two turtle doves in place of the lamb. This tells you the three magi weren't there. It had been a month and they weren't there. They didn't come for over a year later. Okay? But the main thing is, you know, being they both were very poor, they couldn't afford a lamb. They wish they had a lamb, but they did, the lamb of God. And I just think that's what is uh, so exciting about that. And then let's jump to the next chapter in our Torah portion, Leviticus 13. It says, the Lord spoke to both Moses and Aaron. And he says, when someone has a rising in their body skin, let's say it's a scab or a bright spot, and it becomes in the skin of his body, the plague of leprosy. Now, I have in here the Hebrew word for plague. And what is that word? Nega. Or of leprosy, which is sarat. Next week's Torah portion is metzora, which is leprosy. But this is the Torah portion just before, but it already brings it up. And it says, and just so one thing, this leprosy is not like Hansen's disease or the leprosy we know today. It's completely different. How do we know? Because a house can get leprosy. A house can get biblical less leprosy. Clothing can get biblical leprosy. So this is not the leprosy that we think of. Now, let's watch what happens. It says, <clears throat> let's see. They are to be brought to Aaron, the priest, or to one of his sons, the priest. And the priest is to do what? examine the plague in the skin of the body if the hair in the plague is turned white and the appearance of the plague is deeper than the body's skin it's the plague of leprosy and the priest shall do what and pronounce him unclean now here is the word for plague nega all right the other interesting thing though is look at I, well, the word nega, nega means a blow, a plague, to be stricken, a stroke, 
a wound. And look at Isaiah 53, 4. Surely he has borne our sickness, he's carried our sufferings, yet we considered him plagued, struck by God, and afflicted. Well, that word for struck in Hebrew in Isaiah 53 is the same word. And what happened? Well, before I tell you what happened, listen to what it says in the Babylonian Talmud. They, now, this was written a couple thousand years ago. And they're trying to figure out who the Messiah is, okay? This is even, you know, this is right around Messiah. They ask, what will be the Messiah's name? And the rabbi said, he will be known as the leper scholar. He'll know all about leprosy because, and back in the Talmud 2,000 years ago, they wrote that, that Isaiah, Isaiah 53 applied to the Messiah, they don't do that now, but back then they did. And they said, why will he be called the leper scholar? Because surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him a leper, smitten of God and afflicted. And that is in Sanhedrin 98b. So a lot of times the Jews today will say Isaiah 53 doesn't concern the Messiah. Well, how come they said it did 2000 years ago? Now, the word can also refer to being strict stricken as stricken with a disease. Yet they need not be understood in that way. It's much like our English work, stricken, can refer to stricken with disease or just simply hit as with a fist. Either way, Yeshua was stricken. He was stricken with the Roman whip, a fist, a reed. Look at John 19.1. So Pilate then took Yeshua, and what did he do? He flogged them. John 19, 3. And he said, Hail, King of the Jews. And what did they do? They smote him with his hands. He's literally fulfilling Isaiah 53, as the Jews and the Gentiles both are striking him. Look at Luke 22, 63 and 64. The men who held Yeshua mocked him and beat him, having blindfolded him. They struck him on the face and asked him, prophesy, who is the one who struck you? Matthew 27, 30. They spit on him. They took the reed and they smote him on the head. This is the week before Passover. And here we are looking at this and we're seeing him flogged and struck and beat. And that's exactly what Isaiah 53 says. And that's what the Jews said 2000 years ago. That's how you'll know he's the Messiah. Now, just as the leper was despised and rejected by people, so the Messiah was despised and rejected. Now here's what's interesting. And again, this is an ancient Jewish literature. They wrote, that in the Garden of Eden, there is a palace called the Palace of the Sons of Sickness. This palace, the Messiah enters and he summons every sickness, every pain, every chastisement of Israel. They all come and rest upon him. And that is written by the Jewish people over 2000 years ago. Now, we just read that once, but look how many times it says this. Leviticus 13, 5, what is the priest to do? Examine him on the seventh day. And then verse 6, the priest shall examine him again. And verse 8, the priest shall examine him. Leviticus 13, verse 9 and 10, when the plague of leprosy is in a man, he shall be brought to the priest and the priest shall do what? Examine him. Verse 12 and 13, if the leprosy breaks out all over the skin, and the leprosy covers all of the skin of the infected person from his head even down to his feet as far as it appears to the priest, then what is the priest supposed to do? Examine him. Verse 15, the priest shall examine the raw flesh. Verse 17, and the priest shall examine him. Verse 20, the priest shall examine him. Verse 21, but if the priest examines it. Verse 26, but if the priest examines it. Verse 27, and the priest shall examine him. And then verse 30, the priest shall examine the plague. This goes on in verse 31, 32, 34, 36, 39, 43, 50, 53, 55. What is the priest supposed to do? Okay, I think we got that down. Okay, now, here's what is so incredible. 
Look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 2 through 4. A leper comes to Yeshua and he worshiped him. And he said, Lord, if you want to, you can make me what? Now, here's what you have to do a double take on. They can't be clean until they are healed. And that's why the priest examines him. This guy still has leprosy. He's not asking the Lord to heal him. He's asking the Lord to cleanse him. And to cleanse him, he knows he has to be healed. So in one sense, what he's saying, Lord, I want you to not only heal me, I also want you to cleanse me. These are two completely different things. The leper can't come into the fold. They have to stay outside and the priest goes to him and examines him. And then if he is cured, then he can come into the camp and be cleansed. All right? Now, look what Yeshua says. Yeshua stretches out his hand and he touched him and he says, I want to be made clean. Immediately, his leprosy was cleansed. And Yeshua said, don't tell anybody, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Okay, what is so significant? Well, <clears throat> the main thing is this. Here we have Metsora, which means leper. But I'm going to show you something. But first I want to say this. Why did Yeshua tell him to go and show himself to the priest? Huh? And everybody knew him. He's had it for a long time. But the purpose was to let them know the Messiah has come. That is the whole reason why. And we're going to look at that more in just a minute. But first, I want to show you something about the word leper in Hebrew. Uh, look at Numbers 12.10. What does it say? The cloud departed from over the tent, and behold, Miriam was what? Leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked at Miriam, and behold, she was what? Wow. Why was she leprous? Does anybody remember why she went, got leprous? See? Moses married a woman who was black. And Miriam, the Ethiopian lady, okay? And, and Miriam was bad-mouthing Moses because of that. And many of you don't realize this, but you see it in the Hebrew. Basically, God says, uh, you like white? I'll make you white. And she became as white, white, white as snow because she was so prejudiced. It was a payback. Oh, you like white? Here's white. Bright white. And so she had to watch her evil tongue. It was because of her evil tongue. Well, look at this. Now, again, modern day leprosy isn't caused by an evil tongue. You following me? But look at the word leper in Hebrew. You can separate that into two words, and those two words mean evil speech. Ra is evil. The mem thade is speech. The very fact you get leprosy, it's from evil speech. Isn't that amazing? It's built into the very word. Look at Psalm 64, verse 3. It talks about people who wet their tongue like a sword and they bend their bows to shoot their arrows, even what? Bitter words. So here we are and we're shooting arrows at our target, even though they are far away and it's like gossip. People who are far away and you end up speaking evil about that person. And why does the Bible say their tongue can be a sword and they're shooting their arrows or bitter words? It's because you can stand in one place, but your words can wreak havoc on someone else who's far away. Sometimes they even get deflected, okay, from the object of their venom and they strike innocent bystanders. 
That's what gossip does. You go talk to someone that's not a part of the whole thing anyway, and now they get affected. Hateful words lead to hateful actions. People who hate Israel and they say horrible things about Israel, it leads to actions against Israel. Often our thoughts find expression in spoken words, and spoken words seek realization through our deeds. Every word that we utter is real, and it has an impact even when it is not seen in the physical world. Lashon hara, or the evil tongue, is a weapon that is manufactured entirely from your mouth. That's what it is, from your words. Yet the Torah considers the harm those words create to be massive. Now, <clears throat> cleansing comes after healing. The reason why Yeshua wanted him to go to the priest is because no one in Israel had ever been cleansed of leprosy. And now they got to get out their leper recipe book. It's like, oh my gosh, how, this has never happened in 2,000 years. Look what it says here in Mark 1, 40 through 45. Another leper comes to him, begging him, kneeling down and saying to him, if you want to, you can make me clean. And being moved with compassion, he stretched out his hand. And what did he do? That means he became unclean. You have to realize Messiah became unclean his whole life. He always took on our uncleanness. He had to have the ashes of the red heifer put it on him all the time. And then it says, when he said this, immediately the leprosy departed. That means he was healed, okay? And he was made clean. That's the second thing. And he strictly warned him again and immediately sent him out and said to him, don't say anything to anybody, but go and show yourself to the priest, offer for your cleansing. Here, even though he's already healed, he's already cleansed, he tells them to offer for your cleansing the things which Moses commanded. Why? A testimony to them that the Messiah has arrived because they always knew the Messiah was the leper scholar who knew all about leprosy. And he spread about the matter so that Yeshua could no more openly enter the city, but was outside in desert places and they came to him from everywhere. Look at 2 Kings 5.1. Remember Naaman, the captain of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable. Because of him, the Lord had given victory to Syria. Oh my gosh, the Lord is giving victory to the enemies of Israel. He also was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Well, look at Luke 4, 27 through 29. Yeshua is saying there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed except Naaman, who's the foreigner, who's not of Israel. And so they were all filled with wrath in the synagogue as they heard these things. And they rose up and threw him out of the city, led him to the brow of the hill that their city was built on, that they might throw him off the cliff. Now, how many of you ever heard of Yom Kippur? Okay, what do they do on Yom Kippur? They have two goats. Where does one go? This event happened on Yom Kippur. On Yom Kippur. He was in the 40 days of the wilderness when you read... And from Elul 1 to Yom Kippur is 40 days. He comes out, he's in the synagogue for Yom Kippur, and they try to throw him off the cliff like the scapegoat because that's who he was. But they weren't able to do it because it wasn't his time. But here's what he's telling them. And think about this. Why would there be like four chapters on leprosy and the recipes in the Bible and they never could use the recipe? That tells you it has great significance concerning the Messiah. That's why they said after, I mean, Moses, let's say, was 1500 BC. It's now been 1500 years, and they've never used the leper rep uh, recipe. And, and so they're thinking, wow, I, I, you know, all, there's all these lepers in Israel, but none of them ever got healed. Therefore, they didn't need to be cleansed with the recipe. And now all of a sudden, Messiah shows up, and the lepers are getting healed. They're getting cleansed, saying the Messiah is here. Okay. 
Look at Luke 4, uh, 27, 20 through 9. It says they're all filled with wrath and they wanted to throw them off the cliff. So the question is, why so many words on cleansing a leper in the Torah if it's rarely ever used? Well, the testimony is to the religious leaders that Messiah, the leper scholar, had arrived. So let's look at Matthew 11, verse 4 and 5. <clears throat> Yeshua answered them, go Oh, remember John the Baptist or Yochanan the Immerser? <clears throat> and, and in case you didn't know, his real name was Yochanan, which means God is gracious, God is merciful, God is kind. Okay, he's in prison, and he, he wants to know if he's the Messiah or not. Remember? Many people think, why was he doubting? Okay, why? You know, he's his cousin. They grew up together. He's the one who announced, this is the Lamb of God. Why is he all of a sudden questioning? Does anyone remember why I told you the other week? Because Israel always believed in two messiahs, one that would come on a donkey and one that would come in the clouds. Okay, and so John isn't doubting. He's in prison ready to die, and he asks his disciples to go ask Yeshua, are you the suffering servant messiah or the coming king messiah? That's what he was asking. Or are you going to fill, fill both? Why? Because I'm about to be killed. And so Yeshua tells John's disciples to go back and tell him, go and tell Yochanan the things which you hear and see. The blind are receiving their sight. The lame walk and the lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised up. The poor have good news preached to them. Okay, so he, he's saying, look, I, I am the Messiah. Now, what was the recipe? This also tells you that this is not normal. Here you go, I got a picture of the whole recipe. You have to have two live birds, some cedar wood, some scarlet wool, some hyssop, an earthen vessel, and you have to have living water put in it. So what happens? One of the birds, is killed over the living water, creating the mixture of the water and the blood. Isn't that interesting? Then the live bird is bound to the wooden, to the wood from the cedar tree with the scarlet thread, with the hyssop, and then he's dipped into the blood and the living water mixture within an earthen vessel. And so here Messiah comes in an earthen vessel. He is the living water. He's nailed to the piece of cedar. He's bound to it with a scarlet thread. Everything is portrayed in here. The leper was then sprinkled seven times. Then the living bird was let go. You can imagine him saying, I'm out of here. <laughs> he takes off. Uh, and then the cedar wood is known for its incorruptibility and its inability to decompose. And we know Messiah did not decompose. The scarlet wool came from a lamb, okay? Representing the blood of the lamb and the living water to carry our sins away. The entire recipe is showing the Messiah. Now, here is something else that I also find very interesting. Ezekiel. How many of you love the book of Ezekiel? And Ezekiel 44, who knows what Ezekiel 44 through 48 is all about? It's about the millennial reign temple, the temple that will exist during the millennial reign that the Messiah himself is going to build. And this is going to be mind blowing for many people. But let's look at what is going to be happening in the temple that will Messiah will build that will be here for a thousand years. Ezekiel 44, verse 9. The, the Lord brought Ezekiel by the way of the north gate to the front of the temple. Okay, the temple faced which direction? East. So if we're looking west, we're going to see the front of the temple because it's facing east. To the north is going to be to the right. And it says, I looked and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. How do you know the glory of the Lord was not there during Yeshua's time? It wasn't there in Ezra and Nehemiah's time. 
It was there in Solomon's temple, but then it left and it never came back and left from the Mount of Olives. And it's going to return to the Mount of Olives and then be in the new temple. But look at what it says. The Lord, he falls on his face. And this is how we know this is future, guys. And the Lord said to me, son of man, mark well, see with your eyes, hear with your ears, all that I say to you concerning all the ordinances of the house of the Lord with all of its laws, mark well who may enter the house and all who may go out from the sanctuary. And then he says, now say to the rebellious, to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, O house of Israel, let us have no more of all your abominations. And then look at what God says. Look what Israel actually did. Many of you may not even have realized this. God is telling Israel, you brought in foreigners who were uncircumcised where? In their heart and in their flesh to be in my sanctuary to defile it, my house. And you're offering my food, the fat and the blood. Then they broke my covenant because of all your abominations. And look, and you have not kept charge of my holy things, but you sent others to keep charge of my sanctuary for you. So the Levites had pagans and other people take care of the temple doing what they were supposed to do. That actually happened. They had people who were not priests during the time of the Babylonian destruction of the temple. They weren't even priests, but they were too lazy. They hired or they had summoned other people that weren't even priests to do the work. And then he says, thus says the Lord God, no foreigner who is uncircumcised in heart or uncircumcised in flesh will enter my sanctuary, including any foreigner who is among the children of Israel. Well, guess what? Nobody knows if one another's heart is uncircumcised. This is why during the millennial reign, the Messiah himself will be here and he will determine if your heart has been circumcised or not. So this is going to apply to men and women. Now look at verse 16 and 17 of the next chapter. All the people of the land will give this offering for the prince in Israel. Then it shall be the prince's part. The prince is going to give burnt offerings, grain offerings, drink offerings at the feast, at the new moons and the Sabbath and at the appointed seasons of the house of Israel. Do you realize during millennial reign, we're still be keeping the new moon. We're still gonna be keeping the Sabbath. We're still gonna be keeping all the feasts. This is gonna happen during millennial reign, guys. And there's gonna be a temple. So here we see, during the new moon, everyone is going to come together to worship the Lord. But watch this in the very next verses, 18 through 20. Thus saith the Lord God in the first month on the first day of the month. When you hear the first month, first day of the month, what comes to mind? Nason 1. That's when the eclipse just happened. Okay. And it's always a new moon. And it says, and this is of Nisan, Passover time. Take a young bull without blemish and cleanse the sanctuary. The priest will take some of the blood of the sin offering, put it on the doorpost of the temple, the four corners of the ledge of the altar, on the gatepost of the gate of the inner court. And you so shall do on the seventh day of the month for everyone who has sinned unintentionally or in ignorance, and you shall make atonement for the temple. Wow. On the seventh day, also of the month of Nisan, for all those who sinned, how? Unintentionally or in ignorance, not for intentional sin. This is for unintentional sins. And then look at Ezekiel 45, 21 through 25. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, you shall observe what? Oh my gosh, we're going to keep the Passover for a thousand years? Hello? They're not going to keep the Easter bunny. Okay. They're going to keep the Passover on Nisan 14. And their unleavened bread is going to be eaten. And on the day the prince shall prepare himself and for all the people of the land, a bull for a sin offering. On the seven days of the feast, this is referring to the feast of unleavened bread, he shall prepare a burnt offering, seven bulls, seven rams without blemish daily for seven days, a kid of the goats for a sin offering, and shall prepare a grain offering of one ephah for each bull and one ephah for each ram together with the hen of oil for each ephah. And then look what it says. 
in the seventh month, on the 15th day of the month. What is that? Seventh month, 15th day, the 15th day, the Feast of Tabernacles. You can only have a new moon on the first day of a month. You can only have a full moon in the middle of the month. So when this says, okay, that um, you observe Passover, then it says the seventh month on the 15th day of the month, you know that's a full moon. That's the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot. At that feast, you'll do likewise for seven days according to sin offering, to burn offering, to grain offering, and the oil. Do you realize that means there will be animal sacrifices all through the millennial reign. It's not gonna be done away with. The temple's gonna be here. There's gonna be animal sacrifices on Passover and the Messiah himself is gonna be here saying, remember this, do this in remembrance of me because it's all about the Messiah. There's nothing wrong with animal sacrifices unless of course you're one of those animal advocates kind of thing. But it's like, how many of you are, get all upset when you eat a steak? Hello, that's what it's, God wants a meal with us. None of the sacrifices were for intentional sins. None of them were for intentional sins. The sacrifices were for a thanksgiving offering. You wanted to offer your whole self to the Lord. They weren't even mandatory, but we'll go more into that as we go. Okay. Now look at Ezekiel 46.1. This is during the millennial reign. Thus says the Lord God, the gateway of the inner court that faces toward east will be shut for the six working days, but on the Sabbath, it'll be open. And on the day of the new moon, it will be open. Wow. So again, we'll be keeping the new moon. We'll be keeping the Sabbath and it will be Shabbat, not on Sunday. Ezekiel, uh, let's see. Yeah. Likewise, the people of the land will worship at the entrance of this gateway before the Lord on the Sabbath and the new moons. And then finally, verse 13 through 15, you shall daily make a burnt offering to the Lord of a lamb of the first year without blemish. That'll be going on every day during the millennial reign. You'll prepare it every morning and you shall prepare a grain offering with it every morning, a sixth of an ephah and a third of a hen of oil to moisten the fine flour. The grain offering is to be what? A perpetual ordinance to be made regularly to the Lord. Thus, they shall prepare the lamb, the grain offering and the oil as a regular burnt offering every morning for 1,000 years. Amazing. With that, let's stand. We'll close in prayer and then we'll uh, take a break. We got all kinds of refreshments downstairs and then we'll have worship and then we'll come back and we'll have Lord, God, those more. Yay! We can hardly wait. Avinu Mokenu, our Father King, we just want to thank you so much for everything that you're doing in each one of our lives. I pray, Lord, that you would continue to open our eyes that we may see, open our ears that we may hear, open our hearts that we may understand what you are trying to tell us and to prepare us for. Father, I just want to thank you right now for all of those all over the United States, all over the world that are taking the light of your Torah to the nations of the world. We love you so much. We thank you for any tithes and offerings that come in to your ministry. It isn't ours. Uh, we're just a conduit and we just want to bless you and bless your people. Even as you say in your word, the one thing that you want is that your Torah would be magnified and honored once again. And that is our mission. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua, you alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. But now, drum roll. Glory! Cardos and more. Come on up here. <clears throat> Were you going to use this mic? Or a, I am. You are? Okay. All right. Thank uh, you. One of the things I just wanted to say, I really appreciate, I know Bill Voice and I have uh, had a relationship with Lori and Stan for a, a long time, at least 10, 15, 12, 12 years something like that. 
uh, and we just love her passion uh, and what she is doing. Uh, she's been involved in a lot of politics, a lot with the school curriculum. How many of you know our school curriculum is a total disaster? How many of you, though, would want to do something about it? Oh, no, that's another question. <laughs> but anyway, all of you, all of the United States that are watching right now, I want you to pay close attention, as well as everyone here in Washington State, to what she has to share. She is a strong advocate and she's accomplished many things, and we just appreciate uh, what she and Stan have been doing all of this time. And let's give a big hand to Lori! Yay! Thank you, Pastor Mark. Bill, thank you, and Rocio also for your longtime friendship. LaDonna, is LaDonna here? And Chipper, have they arrived yet? I wanna thank them for their hospitality and hosting Stan and I. So, ladies and gentlemen, I just, I so appreciate Pastor Mark and the, the ministry that he has. As you said, as I said, 12 years, um, it's probably longer, but he was one of the first pastors I met that were teaching about the Hebrew roots of the Christian faith. And what I was seeing, what God was showing me in my quiet time as I was studying the word, he was preaching and teaching. And that's how we became connected because in Nashville, I couldn't find anybody teaching the Hebrew roots. In fact, there were pastors that would say, stay away from the Hebrew roots crowds. So, <laughs> yes. So anyhow, um, there's so much going on, ladies and gentlemen. And yes, as Pastor Mark said, I'm a huge advocate for the state of Israel. And the only reason why I am is because I've read my Bible from beginning to end. And it's very clear, it's very clearly stated that we have a duty. We are duty bound to stand with our Jewish brethren. I was, um, earlier you had made a comment. It reminded me of what happened with Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh. When they were getting ready to, Moses was preparing Joshua to go in, take the land. And you all remember, Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh wanted to stay on the eastern side of the Jordan. They didn't want to cross the Jordan to go and help conquer the land, take the territory. And look at what's happening today in our generation. They're trying to take the territory. And some people don't want to get engaged in this battle. And what did Moses say to them? He scolded them. Will you disappoint your brethren by not crossing this Jordan to help your brethren? to obtain their territory. And he said to them, you will, you can leave your flocks because they wanted the green pastures. You can leave your wives, but all your men of fighting age will cross this, this Jordan and you will help your brethren take their land. I, I get chills right now just thinking about it. You know, Washington DC tomorrow, all these leaders are coming together and we are coming, standing united, saying, no, you cannot take that land. And yes, Judah, our Jewish brethren, Israel, Prime Minister Netanyahu, we are gonna stand with you. We're gonna fight along your side. We're gonna cross this Atlantic Ocean or wherever you're coming from in, in the world on the planet. We're gonna cross over and we're gonna help you take your territory. We are not gonna stand by. I was just talking to a friend of mine. I was just talking to a friend of mine who's our senior and also senior academic advisor, um, Dr. Alfonsi, Sandra Alfonsi, she's in Jerusalem. Had a ha heartbreaking conversation this morning. She was, cause I called her, I could tell in a text message she sent to me earlier that she was stressed. That what's happening in Israel is overwhelming to the citizens who live there. And I, I thank God for the people who are going over there. Pastor Mark's gonna be going over there. I know many of you will be going over in September. This is so important that we go over to Israel, that we stand with our brethren, even in the midst of war. So we show them our dedication, that we are committed to stand with them. We are not gonna let our government divide the land of Israel. The Bible is clear. It repeats over and over and over that we are to stand with our Jewish brethren but one of the areas is Pastor Mark brought up is the area of education. If we're gonna fight to help our brethren, we've got to prepare the next generation. 
How many of you are aware of the anti-Semitic, anti-Israel, anti-American, anti-Judeo-Christian values that are being peddled to our children on a daily basis in this country and in many countries around the world? There are, I think we said South Africa was on. I know South Africa has been involved in researching the content in the textbooks and the curricul curriculum. This is a book I'm going to show you, we're going to talk about in just a minute, that's up on the screen. But I want to talk to you about what's happening here, because this is why I'm here today. I read an article about the, um, the state legislature here in Washington state had introduced a bill, a good bill, on Holocaust education, making it a requirement for students K through 12 to learn about the Holocaust here in Washington state. This is very important. But a Democrat decided, and I'm not picking parties here, but she happened to be a Democrat, I'm just telling you, puts together an amendment and slaps it on this good Holocaust education bill, and her amendment is supporting Hamas. It is a pro-Hamas amendment. This is in your state, ladies and gentlemen. This is your government. I know many people don't spend a lot of time paying attention to what's happening in our state legislatures, but ladies and gentlemen, states' rights. We are a united states of 50 states that govern ourselves, and we need to tell the federal government and Bill Gates, yes, we're in his territory, and I am so glad to be here, because you know what? He keeps stepping into mine. So I am here to make you aware of this problem. How many of you are aware of what's going on with education in your, your state legislature? Okay, well, we need to increase those numbers, and that's why I'm here. Let's talk about this a minute. Let's pull up on the screen. There's an article um, about this, the state legislature and this bill. We can pull up on, there's an image, there we are. This is the headlines of Red State, disgusting. Washington Democrat lawmakers introduced Hamas amendment to Holocaust education bill. This happened back in February. We have to form as a united front in order to stand with our brethren, because not all of us can go across the Atlantic or the Pacific and go stand in Israel. But this is how we can help Israel locally by making sure our state legislature is, is representing our values. There's another um, image I want to show you, a school. It's Siri, um, if we can bring that up on the screen. Siri in Shoreline, Siri Elementary, Shoreline, Wisconsin. One more, should be the next slide. There we are, seven-year-olds. This is teaching seven-year-olds that Israel must be destroyed. Seven-year-olds elementary first grade and if they're teaching this to the elementary kids to, to seven-year-olds you can only imagine what they're teaching the kids in high school 9 through 12. this again is happening in your state and i'm coming to you when i called pastor mark i said do you know about this there can't be i said pastor mark there's got to be people who don't agree with this in Washington state, I know it's a, it's a left-leaning state, but I cannot believe that there are people who agree with their government because when I go to speak in different states across this country about this very issue in their states, more people agree with me than agree with their government. They don't support these values. And we've got to be able to have our voice heard, and that requires that we have to be engaged locally. This all started with the human geography textbook that was up on the screen. I want to tell you a little history. How did we get to this place? So back in 2012, a parent who is a member of our organization, Proclaiming Justice to the Nations, in fact, if you go to the website, pjtn.org, you can sign up to get on the mailing list so you'll stay informed as to what's going on across the country and also in your state. But a mother came to me and we lived in Williamson County, Tennessee. It's the belt buckle of the Bible Belt. 
It's a red state. It's a state that is, you know, there's a, bi there's a church on every street corner. And she said, you'll never believe what we're teaching our kids in Williamson County Schools. She brings me the textbook you saw up on the screen. And I read through the textbook, two places. There was one anti-Semitic quote that legitimized Palestinians blowing themselves up in a Jerusalem restaurant because they were waging a war against Israeli government policies and army actions. The other one was talking about the so-called disputed territories. Well, I, I like to um, quote uh, Menachem Begin. Menachem Begin said, these are not disputed territories. They are liberated territories. And that is exactly the truth, ladies and gentlemen. God made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants forever. He gave them that land. We are repeatedly told in the Bible, you are not to, to remove the ancient boundary stones. And what are we doing? Our government is doing that. It's trying to do it right now. And even our state legislatures, as you saw with the two articles that we pulled up, just as an example. But the mother, I, I asked the mother, I said, can you leave this textbook with me? And I read that book from cover to cover. Not only was there anti-Semitic and anti-Israel content, there was anti-American, anti-Judeo-Christian, anti the values you and I share, which the majority of Tennesseans share as well. And unfortunately, this school, this was being taught in, a, in the belt buckle of the Bible belt a school in a community where there are Christians involved or in the community that didn't even know this was going on. So we decided we were gonna take the book on to try to remove it. And I wanna share this story because it's important for you all to know, I'm sure many of you, how many of you get involved in politics on a daily basis, you know, very few. And that's, you know what? That's reflective of most of the country. But unfortunately, in this country and in that community, people not knowing what was being, was being taught to their children, these kids were being indoctrinated with this propaganda in that textbook that was being used in that classroom. So we went through the proper protocol to try to remove the book. We asked the principal, we asked the teacher, we went to the school board, we went to the superintendent. And so the superintendent decided, okay, we're gonna form a committee, we're gonna review the textbook and then we're gonna let you know what our decision is based on the findings. Well, they went through the whole procedure and they were gonna vote one night at a school board meeting. This one mom, again, one person, all it took was one mom. We mobilized, we used our media background experience to mobilize the community. And we brought, we told the community, you gotta show up at the school board meeting because they're gonna vote whether they're gonna keep that textbook or they're gonna get rid of it. Well, we had a standing room only crowd that night. School board meetings, if any of you have been to school board meetings, there's usually nobody sitting there watching government in action or our school board in action. And so this particular night, there were people coming in the door, one after another after another to the point it was standing room only, you could see on the faces of the school board members, what the heck is going on? They had no idea what we were planning. We signed up because you do get public comment time. We signed up for our two, three minutes to speak. And when I got up and told them we wanted the textbook removed, I also reminded them that that happened to be an election year. And I said, if you do not, if you do not remove this textbook, from our children's schools, you've heard what, what the other parents and taxpaying citizens have had to say. If you don't remove this textbook, we're gonna remove every one of you from office. Now, I had never done anything like that before. But as Pastor Mark knows, I can kind of be a little bold at times. And they voted that night. They voted to keep the textbook. They went against the wishes of the majority of the parents and citizens. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, you may not have kids in the school system. You may not have grandkids in the school system. You are a taxpayer. 
And so those textbooks sitting in your classrooms, in your community, you paid for. We the people have got to be more involved in what's happening in our local government, especially in our children's classrooms. Our kids are our future. We are told repeatedly in the scripture, train up your child in the way that they should go. Well, that also includes what they're being taught in our local schools. If we don't speak up and we don't protect these kids' minds, we're going to lose this republic. We are under judgment. We just had a solar <laughs> eclipse. Let's just make it plain as day. But getting back to the ho organizing the citizens, that night when they voted, we had four months to be able to organize, find candidates to run for school board in order to flip that school board to do exactly what we told them we were gonna do. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? Four months, we flipped that school board. We'd never done it before, none of us, but we became activists in a greater, in a major way in our community. And we said, not on our watch are you gonna do this. And the fact that we were able to accomplish that, it scared the bejeebers out of the Republican state government. Because at that time we were a red state. How in the world did these books get into our children's classrooms? Okay, so the local school district, but what, the state, our, our Republican leaders knew that as we kept digging, we were gonna find out how these books even got into the classrooms. And it happened in the state legislature. It happened with the department, the State Department of Education. It happened with the Education Committee, which I serve on now. Fortunately, I have the honor of our, by our Speaker of the House in Tennessee to serve on the Textbook Commission and the Standards Review Commission because of all the work that we have done. I am not a teacher. I'm the president of a nonprofit pro-Israel organization, but I saw an area in order to defend Israel, we have to start educating the next generation. So as we, when we, were, when we launched that campaign, we used media to do it. Fox News picked up the story of what happened in Tennessee. The state legislature was asking to hold hearings. They wanted to see the examples that we found in the textbook. This is how we were able to change the laws in the state. Now in the state of Tennessee, text, textbooks, instructional materials must be accurate. They must be um, unbiased and they must reflect the values of our community. We are working on trying to get that legislation passed in other state legislatures as well. Because we have to say what we're going to accept as we the people to use to educate our children. One of the biggest culprits, the book that you saw, the um, Pearson Human Geography textbook. How many of you are familiar with Pearson publishers? They're also known as Sabas. No, okay. So let me tell you a little bit about Pearson. Pearson, is the largest textbook publishing company in the world. They're the largest publisher in the United States. They are buying up all the smaller textbook publishing companies, not changing the name of those companies, keeping the same name because they don't want us to figure out that they have a monopoly on our children's education. Guess who the four largest shareholders happen to be? Cutter, who's Cutter? You know, Cutter's doing the negotiations right now in the Middle East. Who are the other shareholders? Turkey, Turkey's threatening Israel right now. How about Libya? They're kind of silent on Israel for the time being. So Cutter, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Libya. They're the four largest shareholders. Do you think they're getting a good return on their investment? Look at what's happening in the streets of our cities. How many of you have seen the kids that are K through 12 age marching in the streets, calling death to Israel from the river to the sea? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, this is happening in our country. How did our kids get to this place? Because we have been filling 
their heads with this propaganda for at least 12 years. We know it's longer. We just haven't gotten the dates yet. But I will tell you, in the research that we did, we saw the transition of textbooks and the content in textbooks starting back as far as 1982. These are the people that are influence, influencing. Who else is influencing our children's education? Bill Gates. Bill Gates came to Tennessee. We have an evangelical, Republican, Christian, conservative governor. And Bill Gates brought him a check of $34 million for education. And Bill Gates also told Tennesseans that he was gonna be involved in education for the next seven years. Not if we can help it. This is the problem, ladies and gentlemen, but as we started to, to push this message out through the media, Fox News picked up the story, they ran with it for two weeks, we started hearing from people all over the country, mostly from Florida. So we've been working in the state of Florida for 12 years as well, trying to help them remove, flip their school boards and remove this curriculum and change the laws to make sure the textbooks are accurate, unbiased and reflect the values of our community. So I went to go see then Congressman DeSantis. He was running for governor at the time, went to DC, brought the textbooks. I brought three examples of what was being used in Florida, which were similar to what we were using in Tennessee. And I showed him the examples and he said to me then, he said, I'm running for governor. If I get elected, I'm getting rid of Common Core because Common Core is the delivery platform and I'm getting rid of these textbooks. So he gets elected and what's the first order of business? He has a, a press conference and he announces at the press conference, he's getting rid of Common Core and he's getting rid of the propaganda in the textbooks. Why? Did he say? Because someone came to me and showed me what was in the textbooks. It only takes one person to influence one leader who will actually do what he said he would do. Governor DeSantis also allowed his Department of Education invited us to sit on their textbook review commission and he called for an emergency review of civic standards and we were invited to participate in drafting civics, social studies, and Holocaust standards for the state of Florida. And we were able, because of Governor DeSantis, his Department of Education, we were able to ensure that the textbooks that, that the children in the state of Florida, K through 12, every year, it was gonna be required to teach civics. Holocaust studies. So it was required that it was that they were having they were going to have to teach these things to the kids. But also we were able to incorporate into those standards the role that the Hebrew Bible played in the founding of our nation. The kids in Florida K through 12, 1.8 million will also every year learn not only about the role the Hebrew Bible played but the role it played in our founding documents, the drafting of our founding documents, the role that it played in our form and structure of government. This is being taught in Florida. We took that same initiative. Tennessee had last year was reviewing their civic standards. We brought the same um, content information to the civics I, I was able to serve on the standards committee in, in Tennessee as well. We were able to get them to adopt as well the role that the Judeo-Christian values had on our founding. We didn't get the Hebrew, but we got Judeo-Christian. So now we're, we're working in states like Ohio, in Texas, in Arizona, and God willing, Washington State. So I've been talking to some of the members of your community. And this county, or I, I understand Buckley Pierce County is a red county. And that's where we wanna start. We need to start in a county that shares our values. A county that would be shocked and appalled if they saw the content. 
that is being peddled to our children. They are using our children as propaganda guinea pigs. So I am working with several people in the community now in trying to reach specific leaders on the local school, school board, um, county commissioners, your sheriff. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, when you go, I saw a sign for a sheriff. I don't know, you know if he's a constitutional sheriff or not, but before election day, every one of you need to be on the phone with these candidates who are running. You need to ask them, are you going to defend my constitutional rights if I go meet at my school board and I tell them I want curriculum removed from my children's classroom or I'm a taxpayer and I do not want my tax dollars to go to spend to, to pay for this garbage that you're feeding the kids in our local community. But I can't do it without your help. And that's why I need you all to help me. This is a tangible way ladies and gentlemen, that we can help the next generation. So we can pass the baton, not only of this republic, but our support to the Jewish people, our support for the state of Israel. We have to teach our children an accurate accounting of history. And it requires time and effort. I typically have a chapter in each state that I work with. I don't have one yet, but I'm going to be working on starting one and looking for people who are interested in volunteering to help us with this initiative. It is a tangible way to save our communities. You know, we hear the term, all politics is local, but our focus is always on the federal government. And not that it shouldn't be, because it should. Our presidents, our congressmen, our senators, they should be reflecting our values back here at home. But many of them are not. And when they start seeing people in the community start rising up, when they start seeing people who are starting to question the leadership of some of those who are in positions of authority, it makes them start sweating. Because where do these people come from and why are they so knowledgeable? And why are they challenging us on this? We have the governments that we have, whether it's local, whether it's state, whether it's federal, because we the people have allowed it. We are a nation of people who need to fight for our freedom. Do you know that the rest of the world is counting on us? We have a Bible study we do in South Africa we have supporters in Australia. We have supporters in Poland and all across Croatia, all across the world. Just like what Pastor Mark, people know truth. And these people, even though they may be in another country, Western countries are being targeted by people like Bill Gates. We have to decide, what are we going to do? Are we gonna sit back? And this goes to you all who are watching from around the world. You all have been hearing this, you've heard me, you've been following the, the speeches, the presentations that we've been doing. And if you're not, and you haven't, and this is your first time, we're not sitting here and you're not watching because it just happens to be that you turned on Pastor Mark Biltz today. You're watching because God and every one of you in this room chose for you to be here. My people perish for lack of knowledge. And the knowledge that we're passing to our children is not accurate. We should stop being afraid of teaching our children about our real history. We came, we don't even teach in most schools across this country, we don't even teach the Puritans anymore. Our kids don't know what the Mayflower Compact is. They don't even know what the Magna Carta was. They can't read the Constitution. We don't teach our kids how to write in longhand anymore. Why is that dangerous? Can't read. If you can't write longhand, you can't read longhand. And if you can't read longhand, how can you read original source documents? How can you read documents to know that your freedoms and your rights are not being taken from you? You can't. 
and neither can our children. So with the textbooks being all digital, not all of them, but a lot of them are digital, but a lot of school districts are starting to go back to the good old hardcover textbook because people are complaining. They don't want their children on the internet. They don't want digital. They don't want, in fact, how many of you heard about the three school board members in San Francisco that were recalled? This was a couple years ago. I heard about these parents who joined together. They were all Democrats. Well, with the exception of one couple was not Republican. These Democrats recalled three Democrats on the school board. Why? I flew out there to San Francisco to meet with these people because this was a shocker to me. Because typically the people that I work with are conservatives and happen to be Republicans. I'm not, you know, supporting any candidates here. I know we're a nonprofit, but I'm just telling you, this is the facts. Well, I went to meet with them and I asked them, why? Why did you recall these candidates? And they said to me, these were Asian families, Democrats, high-tech families. They work in the high-tech industry in San Francisco. And they said that we were tired during COVID of watching these three try to change the names of our schools from George Washington to George Floyd. And not only that, this is coming again from Democrats who share the values we share. But not only that, they were tired of their kids being immersed in technology. They want the computers out of the classroom. They want their kids reading books. Again, these are Asian, Democrat, high-tech families. So there is a, a commonality here, ladies and gentlemen. People care about their children. I don't care if you're a Republican, a Democrat, a, a Libertarian. I don't care if you're conservative or liberal. We all care about our children. There was one group that I spoke to, it was a garden club in, in Boca Raton. And pretty much the majority of the people were Democrats in the community, it's Palm Beach County. Um, the couple that invited me were not, they were Republicans. But I shared with them, I went through a whole PowerPoint presentation to show them examples of the anti-Semitic content in the textbooks. At the end of my presentation, one woman raised her hand, this was when President Trump was still president, and she said, what is Betsy DeVos doing about these books? And I said, well, that's a good question because I can't seem to get to Betsy DeVos because the holdovers from previous administrations will not let me have access. We have published white papers and we use these white papers to distribute to school board members, to state legislators, to government officials in Washington, DC, to the president of the United States so they can see just how serious this problem is. And everybody's wondering why are our kids marching in the streets? Again, supporting terrorists, supporting Hamas. But all the evidence is right there if we can just get it to him. And I explained to her, I can't get this to him. But she was, again, a Democrat. She was a grandmother. She cares about what her children are being taught. So I share this as I'm, I'm gonna wrap up um, our time together. I share this with all of you because this is happening on our watch. God didn't put you on this planet to live in this community just because of happenstance. It's just a coincidence. We know there's no coincidence with God. We have to decide whether you're here in this community, whether you're in a community in another country around the globe, we the people we're commanded by God to pursue justice. Justice, justice, thou must pursue. That's not, do I feel like it today? And I know that many of you have very busy lives and you're probably thinking, how can I even get started? I just wanna hear from you. You can, again, for those of you who are watching, 
You can go to pjtn.org. Just send me a note. I want to know more. We'll do a Zoom call. We'll have, we'll bring in everybody who, you know, decides that they want to talk about this and see what feasibly people can do in their community. I just want to remind you all, it only took one mom who found an anti-Semitic quote in her child's textbook. We were able to impact Pearson publishers. Pearson was forced to pull that quote out of their textbook if they wanted to have the business of the state of Tennessee. We can do that in Washington state. And just think about the reverberations it will send across the country when Washington state citizens organize, mobilize, and say we're taking back control of our children's education. Again, it doesn't matter if you have a child in the school system or a grandchild in the school system or a great grandchild in the school system. You pay the taxes. Our hands are guilty. We've allowed this to come in. So we go before the Lord, say, Lord, he nay ni, here am I, send me. I don't know how. I didn't know how to do this. I didn't go to school to learn all this. I saw a need and I had a platform and I have my incredibly wonderful husband, where is he? Who's so talented, who does all our media. Thank you, honey. Who does all our media so we can reach the masses. I hope that you will share the information and share this video with your family and friends and that you talk about what you can do. Start forming a community group. It's not difficult to do, ladies and gentlemen. It just takes people who are willing to get involved, stand shoulder to shoulder to defend our Jewish brethren. Because remember, this all comes back to, are we gonna stand with Israel? Well, the most important part is the propaganda war because we even have Christians, evangelical Christians, even people like Tucker Carlson, who are spewing lies and disinformation by Christ at the checkpoint, which is a fraud. I've written about it many times. Those pastors are not legit. They may have gone to, some of them may have actually gone to seminary, but they're not preaching the word of God. What shepherd or what flock are those shepherds shepherding? It sure isn't the flock of Israel. And that includes us. Because if you are in Christ, Paul said, you are Abraham's seed. You are an heir according to the same promise God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So God bless you all. Pastor Mark, what an honor to be here. I told him I'm coming out to, to, to rile up the troops. Because I can't, again, as I close, and I read those articles here in the state, I said, Lord, there can't be people that don't care about this. There's got to be people who are willing to rise up. And the only congregation I knew to call was Pastor Mark. So anyhow, I just want to thank you again for the honor to be here. God bless you all. Thank you. And again, if you know, after Shabbat, send me an email, pjtn.org, and I would love to, to talk with you and see how we can't organize to mobilize your community and send re those reverberations across the nation. God bless you and thank you.